Well, happy Sabbath from Coffinbury Lake at Fort Stevens State Park. I'm glad that you're able to join us on Facebook or on YouTube and pray that wherever you are, that you sense a special blessing from God on this Sabbath. This morning, what I want to do is look at a fascinating story that takes place between the disciples of John the Baptizer and John when they're confronted with the success of Jesus' ministry. So let's go ahead and pray together and then we'll hop right into the story. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you, and we pray for your Holy Spirit to fill us now as we read your word and as we encounter you through the scriptures. In Christ's name, amen. In John chapter 3, if you got a Bible there, I'm in the New American Standard Version today. In John chapter 3, in verse 22, uh, we're introduced into a discussion that takes place between John and his disciples when they see this success of Jesus's ministry. John chapter three and verse 22. The Bible says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. We find out later that John uh, had been baptizing and now Jesus followers are baptizing. And uh, the text will later clarify that it's not Jesus himself that's baptizing, but his disciples are baptizing. It goes on and it says that he was baptizing in Anon. Uh, John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. And so the text is telling us that John is baptizing in that region because there's a lot of water. And if you're new to the concept of baptism, the scriptures describe this practice by using the word baptism, which means to immerse. And so the idea is to take someone and put them under water as a symbol of the reality that though they had been living, now they're dead and they're back to life. That's what Paul is going to describe for us in terms of the meaning of baptism in Romans chapter 6. It seems when John the baptizer is baptizing, the symbolism is really that you're being washed away, you're being cleansed, uh, your sins are being washed away, that is, you're being cleansed from that defilement. And you need that because your, your life doesn't measure with the character of God. You need to be born again, Jesus would, would say. And John says that you need to repent and be baptized. So this act is to demonstrate that, that people's lives are inadequate in and of themselves and they need a cleansing. And so when Jesus is now uh, in the work of his disciples sanctioning this practice of baptism, the disciples of, uh, of John come to him and they have a question. It says in verse 25 that therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Now, it's a fascinating encounter because you get the idea that John and his followers um, are the, the ones that have been doing baptism primarily, that, that this is not a practice that um, was wholly unfamiliar in the life of Israelites. But you get the sense that when John is doing it, that he and his followers sort of have a corner on the baptism market at the time. And so when Jesus's followers begin to baptize, the disciples of John are concerned and they're coming to John and, and you can just hear in the background in the reading between the lines of the text, there's a sense of them saying, hey, John, you're the one that's the baptizer, but now Jesus is baptizing. What are you going to do about it? What are we going to do? Because he's gaining popularity. Like the text says, all were coming to him now. All are coming to him. So John comment on this thing that's taking place. Now, to really understand this, we need to bear in mind the background to who John the baptizer is and what his influence had been to this time. Remember that by the time we're reading in what we call the New Testament, that 300 years have elapsed since the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament. So Malachi is written about 300 years before the New Testament takes place. And during that time, there's this staggering silence, it seems, on the part of God. There are no prophets that are sent during that time, what we call the intertestamental time, the period between the New Testament and the Old Testament, 
There are no prophets that are sent during that time. And so you can imagine the excitement that registers throughout the land of Israel when a young man begins calling people out to the banks of the Jordan and calling them to repentance. And there are these large crowds that begin to gather around him. And people from all kinds of different backgrounds are coming out to John there at the banks of the Jordan. In fact, if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 3, and we'll see something really powerful here. Luke chapter 3, I'm in verse 7. This is speaking about the ministry of John the baptizer. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 7, it says that John began saying to the crowds who were going out to be bapti baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So, so the text is telling us that there are these large crowds that are coming out to John. And there's a, an excitement. God is at work again. People are asking questions. John, are, are you Elijah or Isaiah or one of the prophets that, that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied? Are you the prophet that we should look for? Are you the Messiah? Who are you? And, and so people are coming to John with these questions. And there's this palpable excitement. But that excitement is even magnified because of the personal integrity of John the baptizer. When people come to him, he's not afraid to stand up and to say, hey, you brood of vipers, are you here just because it's a popularity show? Are you here just to curry favor with others because you want to be associated with me? What are your motives in coming to me? And the text in Luke goes on and it says, that John said to them, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now you might say, wow, that's a really stern message. And, and there's some definite moral integrity that takes place behind that message. John is in earnest and he's calling to people, not just to some popular, exciting movement, but to a reform movement where they're evaluating their lives and they're being transformed. They're being changed. They're being called to, to um, find forgiveness and to act by repentance for their lives. And, and so John has the integrity to do that, the strength of character to do that. And this is really appealing, especially to the popular masses who have come to see in the religious leadership of Israel, nothing that can satisfy the broken and, and sin sick soul. They've come to see that the priests, the rulers are largely actuated by just a desire for display to gratify their own sense of, of ego. And they want to put on this show for others. But there's nothing in what they're presenting, the religion that they're sharing, that satisfies the heart. And so when John is willing to call people out, when he's willing to address the real matters of the integrity of the heart, this registers with people and they see in him something that rings true from the long line of the prophets that have come before, but who have been, as we said, silent for the last 300 years. And it continues on. It says that the crowds were questioning him, saying, what should we do? He would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics, two garments, is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. Okay? So he addresses the crowds about how they can live and, and look out for the needs of others. Verse 12, and some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Verse 14, though, this is wild. Check this out. Verse 14, some soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? He said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. So this is really radical because it's not just the Jews that are now coming out, the, the Jewish people of that time that are coming out to John the, Baptist, John the baptizer, but also the Roman soldiers are coming out to him. And there's something about his message that is shocking, that even in the context of their polytheistic um, world in which there are, are all these various gods, 
not just from their nation, but from the, the nations that they've conquered, all these many gods. But there's something about John the Baptist's teaching and message that is startling and arrests their attention and is unlike what they've heard before. And so they come to him and say, John, how can we align our lives with your teaching? And he has a word for them. So this is powerful. There's a religious leader that hasn't been, a voice like this hasn't been heard in, in some time. And he's so powerful. He's so captivating in what he shares that even the, the nation who is the oppressor of the Israelites has their soldiers coming to him and saying, what do we do? What do we do? And so this is a, a just a little bit of a brief backdrop to help us understand the concern that the disciples of John have when they come to him. Because John the baptizer is prominent. He's powerful. He's got influence. He's got sway. He's not just some crazy wild-eyed fanatic out in the desert. But the crowds are coming to him, and he's drawing an audience that really, really registers. He's someone that's speaking with prophetic authority because of his prophetic calling, his supernatural circumstances around his birth. God is obviously at work through him. But what do you do when the movement that you attach yourself to is now on the decline, no longer increasing in popularity, but seems to be giving way as another, you can hear some people probably celebrating a beautiful day out here at Coffinbury Lake in the background there. But what do you do when the movement that you're attached to is beginning to decline and there's another movement that's ascending that people are transferring their allegiances to. They come to John and they say, John, what do we do? One of the things that is most uh, spectacular about John's life, sure, his integrity, his, his personal integrity uh, is just incredible and noteworthy. But one of the things that really stands out to us about John is his radical humility. In fact, when he's introduced in the Gospel of John, not written by John the Baptizer, but written by the disciple John, maybe a hundred years after the life uh, of Jesus, or sorry, about 100 AD, so about 70 years possibly after Jesus died and resurrected. When John is writing the Gospel about uh, the story of Jesus, and he introduces us to John the Baptizer, this is the way that he does it in John chapter 1. I'm in John chapter 1 and verse 6, if you got a Bible there. John chapter 1 and verse 6 it says, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify, to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light. So the, the writer says, hey, there was this guy that came to testify about Jesus, the light that was coming into the world. And he was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. Now, other people that were followers of John in his time didn't necessarily understand this point. They looked at what John was doing and the success he was having in his personal ministry. They looked at that as something that was an end in and of itself. But the, the Bible didn't describe John as the end. He wasn't the goal, but he was someone that was helping to establish the goal. And that goal was the person of Jesus himself. And so the disciples of John come to him and they say, John, Jesus is on the ascendancy. What do you say? And, uh, and it's fascinating because we find that John has his own personal understanding of his not superiority, not of his um, de deserving to have a great movement following him, but he has a sense of his um, relative inferiority not that he's not that he's um you know defective or something like that in the in the self-critical sense um but he just recognizes that jesus is here and he's down here and his job is to push people toward jesus to help people be attracted to jesus to prepare the way for jesus not to draw them to himself in, fa in fact in matthew chapter 3 verse 13 matthew 3 verse 13 it says that Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus shows up and is going to be baptized by the baptizer. 
Jesus wants to participate in this as a a full way of demonstrating that he is uh, fulfilling all the righteousness of what it means to be a follower of God. And so he's baptized as a man by John. But when he asks John to baptize him, John says, no, 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 no. I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. Jesus responds and he says, permit it at this time. For in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. So John has this self-awareness. Not that he's moping around in some sort of uh, woe is me, uh, perpetual, you know, a perpetual sense of, of, of not being enough, uh, low self-esteem, that, that he has some sort of uh, defective sense of himself. But he just recognizes who he is in relation to Christ. And he recognizes that Christ is is over and above and beyond anything that he is. And so John aligns himself, aligns his life with the purpose of making Jesus known and making Jesus great. And so that's why it is when we come back to the passage that we started off in, in John chapter 3, when the followers of John come to him and say, Hey, Jesus is on the rise. He's on the ascendancy, insinuating, hey, do something about this or everyone's going to follow him instead of following you. In that context, John responds. They came to John. uh, I'm in John chapter three, verse 26 again. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. John says, this thing that's happening with Jesus, this isn't something that has just, um, he's just grasped for himself, but this is part of what heaven is unfolding in our midst. The, The clear application is we can't oppose what God is doing because Jesus hasn't done this by his own, uh, just by himself. This is what the movement of heaven is geared toward. This isn't just a man that's making his own name popular. This is a heavenly movement, John is saying. Verse 28, he says, You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. And I love this illustration that he uses now in verse 29. He says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. I love this illustration. John says, hey, look, if you're having trouble understanding the way to relate to the situation, he says, think of it this way. Throughout history, Israel has been referred to as the bride of God. God has been the bridegroom, the groom, as we would say in our, our, as we would say today in a wedding context, and Israel is the bride. And John says, it's not the role of the friend of the, the groom, what we would call the best man. It's not his role to swoop in at the last minute and take the bride as his own wife. No, in the ancient Jewish context, the bridegroom's uh, friend, what we would call the best man, Function as sort of a mediary, uh, an intermediary between the bride and the groom and made the arrangements so that when the groom showed up, everything was in place so that the groom could come to the bride. So the, the best man, we would call it, his job was to sort of coordinate the festivities of the two coming together so that they could be wed. And so when John is asked, hey, don't you care? Aren't you worried that He's getting all the notoriety. Jesus is getting all this credit now. You're losing followers. He's gaining the followers. Don't you care? John says, no, no, because I understand that I am the best man. And my job is to make sure that people are pointed to the groom, not that they're pointed to me. And so John is not bothered by this. In fact, he says this amazing thing, and and I think this is so key for us. 
He says, this joy of mine has been made full. Man, what a thing to be able to celebrate and to see the, see the success in the life of another and to not have a shred of envy about it, to, but to be full of joy because of the successes of someone else. John's life is remarkably free from envy. He recognizes that his role in the story of Jesus is to point people to Jesus, not to point them to himself. And as he's done that, even as his own ministry is decreasing, and soon John will find himself in a, in a lonely dungeon, John says, my joy is full because I see that the bride and the groom are going to be united. It's not my job to snatch the, the bride for myself. It's my job to set them up. I love this idea that John is free of envy and he's full of joy. Envy, as you know, is this toxic uh, way of looking at the successes or the position of another and wishing that you had that for yourself and not being content with what you do have. Envy is this desire, this jealousy to have what belongs to someone else, to have what God has blessed someone else with, to have it as your own. And, and envy causes us not to celebrate the successes of others, but we scorn them and we lament them and we talk about how we would do better if we were in that position or we could do it right and they don't know how to do it. Envy causes us to think of ourselves as bigger than we are and to think of others as less than they are. Later in the Gospels, Matthew and Mark, we were introduced to Pilate and his decision whether or not to release Jesus. And he's prompted by a desire to have Jesus released because the text tells us that Pilate recognized it was because of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. Pilate could see through the accusations and he recognized that if you boil it all down, what, stand behind, what stands behind their betrayal of the Son of God into his hands, seeking the death of Jesus, was an envy. They looked at what was happening in Jesus, the notoriety that he got, the success that he had, the people that were following him. They looked at him, this homeless 33-year-old Jewish carpenter. They looked at him with envy. Envy will poison our lives. It will absolutely poison our our lives. And sometimes, as here, sometimes the avenue that creates envy in our hearts is our supporters. You see, it wasn't just a, an idle thought that John was thinking about the success of Jesus relative to his own, but it was his friends, his followers who came to him and agitated for him suggesting that he should be envious, that what Jesus was doing was out of harmony with what should happen. It was out of character. John responds and says, no, no, no. What's happening is exactly what needs to happen. But this is a, a great truth about envy, that sometimes the greatest source of trouble that we have, uh, especially dealing with envy, is those that love us and are close to us, that suggest to us that how we have been treated, how we have been dealt, is not fair and that we deserve more. And that can plant ideas and seeds of, of jealousies in our minds that shouldn't be there. And one of the quickest ways to deal with, with those that may be well-meaning but are misguided in, in uh, trying to express the sympathy like this to us, one of the best ways to deal with this is to not sympathize with their suggestions. When people come to us and they suggest to us, oh, you haven't been treated fairly in this regard, but you know that this is what needs to happen, is to not sympathize with them, not give them a glimmer of, you know, you're right, but I'll stand up and be a bigger person anyway. No, to respond like John and say, no one can have anything unless God has given it. And God must increase and I must decrease. This is what's fitting. This is what John does. And this is a, a radical invitation for us to imitate his example of humility and lack of envy, and as we've noticed, one of the, the best ways to experience a lack of envy is to find full joy in recognizing the fulfillment of our mission. God hasn't given all of us the same part 
in his work of sharing the message of Jesus with the world. He's given to some a seemingly lesser role, and he's given to others a seemingly greater role. But when it comes to serving God, because it's God's work, all tasks that God gives are great tasks. Whether it's the simplest, most menial task or the great publicly uh, honored task, God gives all of us an opportunity to be part of his work. And, and it's, a, it's a call, the example of John, it's a call to us to not allow envy to spoil the joy and reward we get from seeing the work of Jesus move forward and to seeing Jesus' name be magnified in the earth. It's a call to us to emulate that example of humility. I love how uh, C.S. Lewis once put it. He said, all of us uh, in the gospel story, all of us get to learn either to play great parts without pride or small parts without shame. God has given us the opportunity to, to learn to do something that people will honor as great, but to do it without pride or to do something little and small and to do it with humility and without shame. Any task that we do for God is a necessarily great task. I love this passage in Isaiah chapter 57. just want to close out with this. Isaiah chapter 57, this special promise from God about those who are humble, that don't allow envy to poison the springs of their life. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Thus says the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. But get this. I dwell on a high and holy place, says this amazing, exalted God, but also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God is the only being in the universe that has no cause to be humble. He has no deficiency. He has no shortcoming. He's never messed anything up. And yet, God has humility to come and to dwell with those that are lowly and contrite. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the radical humility of Jesus and the radical humility of John the baptizer. We pray today that his example of being free of envy and full of joy would be emulated in our own hearts and lives. And thank you, Lord, for your humility, that you who are high and exalted have made yourself low to come near to us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.